The subject of my talk is Sky with Ocean Join, Scaling the Stars at the U.S. Naval Observatory, 1830 to the present. Um, I, I've been the public affairs officer at the Naval Observatory for 27 years. I am finally retiring. Uh, before that, I worked for 19 years for the planetarium at the Air and Space Museum. Uh, so I've been doing this thing, this astronomy thing, for a long time now. Um, the Naval Observatory is one of the most, uh, I think, uh, amazing places that, uh, the, it certainly is the most amazing place that I've ever worked at. Um, and uh, it is uh, a uh, very uh, unique and uh, very interesting little aspect of our military that most people don't get to know. Uh, very well. But let me just uh, give you a brief introduction about me. Um, the guy on the left is actually the same as the guy on the right. Um, the guy on the left is sporting his uh, three-inch uh, Mertz Uchnieder und Fraunhofer refractor that my brother-in-law had sitting in the basement of his house. Um, it was in pretty beat-up shape. And back in 1976, uh, I brought it up to my astronomy club, the Aldrich Astronomical Society in Worcester, Massachusetts. And we did a restoration of it and exhibited up at Stellafane, my first Stellafane in 1976. Uh, but working at the Naval Observatory now, I have a somewhat larger telescope that I get to use. Uh, and uh, that is uh, something that uh, when I retire, I'm actually going to, I'm going to miss because I'm going to lose access to it. But uh, we'll figure out hopefully a way for me to uh, uh, keep going back and, and using it. So the Naval Observatory is probably uh, the oldest scientific institution, uh, continuously operating scientific research institution in the federal government. Uh, we are certainly one of the oldest continuously operating commands in the history of the United States Navy. And I would like to walk you through a little bit of that history uh, this evening and also give you an idea of exactly what it is that we do today and the functions that we have, uh, not only to support the current uh, requirements of uh, the Navy, the Department of Defense, but also the, the general public. Uh, we are kind of behind the scenes in a lot of stuff that goes on that most people don't think about today. So in terms of beginnings, uh, we can look at the date of December 6th, 1830, as the day that we came into existence. That was the date when this gentleman over here, Lieutenant Lewis Goldsboro, received orders from the Secretary of the Navy to establish in Washington a depot for the proper care, repair, and most importantly, calibration of all of the Navy's navigational instruments. And the most important of those were the marine chronometers that were a vital part in celeste, that played the, the most vital part really in the art of celestial navigation. Goldsboro came into this job uh, in kind of an underhanded way. He was uh, delivering on, on, he was on board a vessel that was being delivered to the Asiatic Squadron in the late 1820s. And uh, in those days, there was no Suez Canal, there was no Panama Canal. Uh, so in order to get from the East Coast of the United States to the Far East, it was uh, easier in many ways to sail across the Atlantic Ocean, make landfall to reprovision on the west coast of Africa, sail around uh, the Cape of Good Hope across the Indian Ocean to uh, the Far East. They were 45 days out of New York and expecting to make landfall on the west coast of Africa when they woke up one morning and found themselves bobbing around merrily in the middle of the Cape Verde Islands, somewhat over 100 nautical miles away from where they thought they were. This was a fairly significant error, even in celestial navigation. 
So when they reached the west coast of Africa, Goldsboro decided he was going to try to figure out what the problem was because they had another big ocean that they had to cross and they were aiming for a relatively small target somewhere in the Far East. So he examined the navigator's notes and reductions. He looked at the almanacs. He looked at the sextant. Everything seemed to be in order, but the one thing that he didn't have any really good information on was the rate of the ship's chronometer. In those days, there were no domestic suppliers of chronometers. Uh, all the ones that the Navy had, and it was about two dozen in the total inventory, came from clockmakers in England. And we really didn't know what they used to calibrate the ticking rates of their clocks. So uh, the rating card that came with the clock that was on Goldsboro's ship stated that it gained three seconds a day. When Goldsboro did some rough computations and uh, rough trials on it, he found that it, the error was more like 12 seconds a day. And this compounds every day. So it more than made up for the 100 nautical mile error in their computed position. So when he got back to the States, he wrote a letter to the Secretary of the Navy saying that the Navy needed a facility to essentially calibrate these clocks, and he knew just the guy for the job, namely himself. Now, uh, he was uh, a insider of Washington, uh, and he knew kind of how the game was played. So uh, it turns out that his father was the chairman of the Board of Navy Commissioners who told the Secretary of the Navy what to do, and his father-in-law was the Solicitor General of the United States. So having friends like that, uh, you got what you wanted. Uh, so keep him in mind. Uh, and we're also going to briefly mention Lieutenant Charles Wilkes, uh, who ran the depot from 1833 to 1837, and Lieutenant James Gillis, who was the officer in charge from 1837 to 1842. Now, the old observatory, or the observatory, has actually had a number of homes uh, in Washington. Uh, Goldsboro was given a budget of $330 for fiscal year 1831. Uh, out of that, he had to pay for the rent for the building that was suitable to do his job. Uh, and uh, that uh, cheapest rent that he could find was uh, $250 for an adequate building that was at an area that I guess at the time must have been considered a fairly sketchy part of town, 17th and G Streets Northwest, uh, a couple blocks away from the White House. Um, but there he set up uh, the first depot of charts and instruments. And one of the things that you have to do in order to calibrate a chronometer is establish a reference time scale. Well, today, the Naval Observatory maintains a time scale that is accurate to better than 100 picoseconds per day. Needless to say, in 1830, that wasn't even a thought. Uh, the best available rate that we had or the best available uh, calibration that we had for determining the ticking rates of clocks was the uh, mean rate of rotation of the Earth itself. And there's only one way you can measure that, and that is astronomically. So Goldsboro not only had to build a place that would be safe for storing chronometers and charts and other instruments, he also had to build a small astronomical observatory in order to be able to carry out that work. Uh, so the depot at G Street uh, was occupied for uh, about three years. And then Lieutenant Wilkes took over. Uh, he did not particularly want to commute to that sketchy part of town, and he happened to have a house that was located not too far from the present-day site of Union Station on North Capitol Street. So he moved everything to essentially his backyard, uh, and uh, that became the Capitol Hill Observatory. It was a great spot to do astronomical observations from, except there was this very large building with a dome that sat right on the southern horizon and obstructed about 10 degrees or so of the southern horizon. Um, the astronomers would tell you the best solution would be to tear the building down and level the hill, but that's, of course, where the funding came from, so that was kind of a non-starter. Uh, Wilkes let the observatory stay there 
uh, up until he came back from uh, a series of voyage that he made, which I'll get to in a second, uh, and uh, essentially threw us out. Uh, so in 1842, we had to find temporary quarters up on Pennsylvania Avenue, but by this time, Lieutenant James Gillis had taken over, and he was a mover and shaker, and he managed to persuade people that we needed a permanent observatory site, uh, and so ultimately the site that we became our first permanent home uh, came about under his tenure, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, okay, let's see, there we go. So uh, this is the typical instrument that was used uh, for making transit observations. This is a very small transit instrument. It's mounted in such a way that it can only look along your local meridian line, which is the line from north to south that passes through the point overhead. Uh, we can predict the instant that a particular celestial object is going to cross that line. So it follows that if we can observe it with some degree of precision, we have an anchor point that we can then use to determine uh, a starting point for a time scale. And we would compare chronometers with these readings, and we were interested in understanding how those chronometers behaved in the long term. So typically we would put a chronometer on trial for several months. Once we were satisfied that we knew how that chronometer was going to behave, we could then send it out to sea with a card that tells the quartermaster in charge how fast or how slow the clock runs and gives the date when the clock was calibrated. Uh, so that's kind of the basic idea behind using uh, the transit circle. These are actually some uh, transits that were observed uh, by Lieutenant Wilkes at the Capitol Hill Observatory. Uh, it was fairly meticulous work. It was fairly boring work, but it was vital uh, for determining the rotation rate of the Earth that uh, was necessary for calibrating chronometers. Okay. So Lieutenant Wilkes uh, was uh, relieved in 1837 by Lieutenant James Gillis, and he then went off to lead what became known as the U.S. Exploration Expedition, which lasted four years, uh, 1838 to 1842. Uh, Lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant uh, Wilkes and uh, another junior officer led a party of two ships, uh, they sailed around the Pacific Ocean uh, and stopped at many, many places, did a lot of survey work. And you'll notice down here that he actually sailed along the coast of Antarctica and was the first person to determine that Antarctica was actually a continent. And there's actually a sizable amount of the coast of Antarctica down in this region here, which to this day is still known as Wilkes Land. When he came back in 1842, he had a treasure trove of uh, specimens that he had collected. He had a number of scientists on board, botanists, uh, biologists. They had specimens. They had uh, log books of all the things that they'd observed. They came back with just a huge amount of scientific information. And here's where things get interesting as far as the Naval Observatory is concerned. Back in 1825, John Quincy Adams, when he was president, uh, lamented the fact that there was no observatory in the United States that was run by an institution of higher learning. And he lamented that the European continent had hundreds of these so-called lighthouses of the sky. And he wanted an observatory in the general fund from 1825. Unfortunately, he never got on very well with Congress, so that idea never floated. But he is the only president who was elected to be a member of the House of Representatives after his presidency. So when James Smithson bequeathed to the United States his fortune, which was about 500,000 British pounds, uh, he left it with the proviso that it be used to found an institution for the increase and in diffusion of knowledge. Adams immediately jumped on that and said, we can fund the observatory out of that. But that got voted down by Congress because he still didn't have any friends in Congress. 
ultimately the Smithson Fund went on to found what we today call the Smithsonian Institution. Lieutenant James Gillis was fully aware of all these machinations going on in the background, uh, and he wanted to get some of that funding to build an observatory as well. And he went up through his chain of command to the Secretary of the Navy to try and appeal to Congress to make that happen. But the Secretary of the Navy basically dropped the ball on that, uh, and it didn't happen. But Gillis was also a native Washingtonian, and he knew how the game was played. So he said, okay, I didn't get satisfaction from my chain of command. I will go around my chain of command. And he went and uh, found a sympathetic senator, uh, Senator W.C. Preston from South Carolina, uh, and basically uh, pleaded his case to the senator. And the senator said, uh, this sounds like something that needs to be done. I will help you. And in the first Congress of 1842, he introduced a bill to fund a permanent depot of charts and instruments to the sum of $25,000, which was a lot of money in those days. So Gillis was overjoyed. He began working on designs for the buildings that were going to house the new observatory. Um, he began hiring staff, getting the instruments that were going to go into the observatory. The one thing that he didn't have any choice over was the location. That decision was left up to President John Tyler. John Tyler was the first president who was not elected president. He was William Henry Harrison's vice president, and he hated Washington. Uh, he was much happier spending time down on his farm in Virginia, and as vice president, he figured all he'd need to do would be to come up every now and again, cast a tie-breaking vote in the Senate, and then get on his horse and ride home. But a month after the inauguration, he found himself in the White House. Uh, during the course of his tenure, he never really got to know the city that well. So when they gave him the choice of four sites to locate the new permanent observatory, the site that he chose was in a part of the city, which to this day is still called Foggy Bottom. Let that sink in for just a second. Uh, now, we have a saying here in Washington that no good deed goes unpunished. And this is exactly what happened to James Gillis. James Gillis did all the legwork to get the observatory off the ground, to hire its staff, to get its instruments. He even designed the building that was going to be built to house all this stuff. And he fully anticipated that he would be named as the first superintendent of the new observatory. Uh, unfortunately for him, in 1844, we, re we got a new SECNAV who was from the state of Virginia, and he wanted a Virginia naval officer to be in charge. So he tapped Lieutenant Matthew Fontaine Morey uh, to be our first superintendent. And Morey would have been superintendent for life, but there was this little altercation that arose between Virginia and the Federal Union. Uh, in April of 1861, uh, Maury, being a faithful Virginian, decided that he was going to resign his federal commission, joined the Confederacy, ultimately went on to become an admiral in the Confederate Navy. But here is the building, uh, the observatory at Foggy Bottom, as it was completed in 1845. You can still see the old observatory site today. It's across the street from the State Department. Uh, 23rd between D and E streets. Uh, it's the yellow building with the big dome on top. Uh, it's also uh, owned by State Department and uh, the Navy jointly, so it's not exactly something that you can wander into anymore, uh, but you can still at least see the site. Uh, it still exists today. So some of the new instruments that were located there were state-of-the-art transit instruments, uh, and transits were still vital in determining timescales for the calibration of chronometers. So we had a number of different types of transit instruments, uh, all made by the leading instrument makers of Europe. Um, and uh, we also had what was, at the time, what was known as the Great Telescope, which was a 9.6-inch Mertz and Mahler equatorial refractor. 
This was until the Harvard telescope came along, the largest refracting telescope in the United States. Uh, it didn't last long, but uh, it was a very, very uh, heavily used instrument. Uh, in fact, we had an astronomer who was at the observatory uh, from 1845 to 1867. Uh, he was probably the most prolific observer with the 9.6 inch. He made the first asteroid discovery from the United States, 37 Euphrosyne, uh, and he discovered 50 Virginia and 60 Echo. Uh, he was awarded the Lalande Prize in 1854 and 1860 for his asteroid discoveries, and he published over 90 papers during his career, more than any other pre-Civil War American astronomer. Now, as we move forward, we start to the point where we're getting into the Civil War era. Uh, at this point, Lieutenant Gillis has returned uh, one of the things I forgot to mention was that in order to make sure that Gillis didn't have any say about Maury getting the position, uh, his detailer sent him to South America for four years. While he was there, he founded uh, an observatory in Santiago de Chile, and today that is the Chilean National Observatory. A young astronomer by the name of Asaph Hall was hired in 1862. And being the low man on the totem pole, he was the one who got to show visitors around when people came by uh, to see what was going on at the observatory. In July of 1863, one of those visitors turned out to be Abraham Lincoln, along with an official party of uh, some of his cabinet members uh, and a few of his family members. They came to the observatory and Hall basically showed them uh, the bright star Arcturus and the moon through the 9.6 inch telescope. And everybody left and Hall began to do his routine work of uh, measuring the positions of double stars and that sort of thing. Now, uh, the old observatory site, the access to the 12 or to the nine inch telescope was through a trap door in the floor. Uh, and the astronomers would uh, habitually take a large desk and drag it across that because people would leave Georgetown when the taverns closed, come by the observatory and walk in and, you know, barge in on the astronomers while they were trying to do their work. Uh, so they would put this desk over the trap door. Well, the night after Lincoln leaves, it's early the next morning, and Hall is up there busily doing what it was that he was doing, and he hears this knock on the trap door. And the knock is very persistent. And he waits, and he waits, and the knock keeps, the, keeps coming. So finally, he decides that he's going to give this person a piece of his mind, moves the desk, opens the trap door, up comes a stovepipe hat underneath of which was Abraham Lincoln, who had walked by himself from the White House at 16th and Pennsylvania Avenue to 23rd and D Streets because he had this burning question in his mind, and that was, why did the moon look backwards in the telescope? Uh, in a previous life, uh, Lincoln had been a surveyor, and he was used to the view through a surveyor's theodolite, which shows you a fully erect image. So Hall basically explained that astronomical telescopes do that, Lincoln apparently was satisfied. Uh, he left, but he came back many times as a casual visitor, along with his family members, in particular his son Robert Todd Lincoln, who became a very avid amateur astronomer. So the observatory, uh, here's a view kind of looking over the city in 1861 or so, uh, and the observatory was located right over here. And this is the foundation, the first part of the Washington Monument over here. Now today, if you go out, you'll see there's all kinds of land that's been reclaimed over here, uh, East and West Potomac Parks, uh, the area where the Lincoln Memorial is, all of that was reclaimed, uh, is basically landfill uh, from the Potomac River. The observatory, as you can see, sat on a spit of land and it was basically surrounded on three sides by water bodies. And these water bodies were creeks and canals that were essentially the septic system for the city in those days. 
So our observatory site at Foggy Bottom was surrounded on three sides by river bottom swampland uh, that was essentially the biggest open sewer in town. Uh, I sometimes wonder what it must have been like to be an astronomer in those days on a nice July or August evening when you have to open up the dome slit and that south wind is blowing across the swamp, which has been percolating in the 98 degree sunshine all day. It must have been aromatic at best. And at worst, uh, it would let in clouds of mosquitoes, most of which carried malaria. So not only was it uh, kind of uh, a, an uncomfortable environment, it was also a, an extreme health hazard. Uh, but there were key figures who came along at this particular time. Uh, Rear Admiral Charles Henry Davis, who uh, was the uh, first superintendent of the United States Nautical Almanac Office. He served two terms as our superintendent. And his friend, Professor Simon Newcomb, who came from the Nautical Almanac Office to the observatory and was essentially the most prominent American scientist of the 19th century, even though he was Canadian. Uh, Newcomb's claim to fame is that he uh, completely revised the formulae that were used to predict the positions of the moon and planets used for computing the almanacs, which were used for navigation. Uh, and uh, that was his legacy. One of the other things that he wanted, though, was a bigger telescope. He had noticed that uh, during uh, when, when he was computing his ephemeris tables for Jupiter and Saturn, that Jupiter and Saturn weren't in the spot in the sky where he predicted them to be. Well, Newcomb had a pretty big ego, but even he realized that it wasn't the planets that were disobeying his calculations. It's that his calculations were essentially wrong. Now, at that point in time, they knew of the existence of the planets Uranus and Neptune. Uh, they didn't know the masses of those planets, though. But Newcomb realized that if he could measure the orbital periods and the distances of the moons of those outer planets, he could derive their masses. So in 1867, he began lobbying for a big telescope for the Naval Observatory for that purpose. And his superintendent, Admiral Benjamin Franklin Sands, uh, argued for the telescope on the grounds that it was a matter of national pride. Uh, he pointed out the fact that there were universities, even well-heeled amateur astronomers who had larger telescopes than our measly 9.6 inch telescope. Uh, and he wrote in his superintendent's reports that this was nothing short of a national disgrace. Uh, ultimately, between his arguments and Newcomb's arguments, in 1870, Congress appropriated $50,000 for the construction of the largest refracting telescope in the world with the proviso that it be made by an American firm. And of course, one of the things that Sands and Newcomb both knew is that at that time, the best telescope makers in the world were Alvin Clark and Sons in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So the Clarks got the contract in 1870. Uh, the only part of the telescope that was not of domestic manufacture were the lens blanks uh, for the, di or the, the glass discs for the lenses uh, that Clark would ultimately grind and polish into the objective. Those came from a, uh, there was only one source of those in the world uh, it was a company called Chance Brothers in England. Uh, it took them three tries before they got satisfactory discs. It almost bankrupted the company, but uh, the uh, great telescope was duly completed. It took Alvin Clark two years to grind and polish the lenses, and his son, George Bassett Clark, designed all the mechanicals, the mounting and the dome and everything. Uh, and... In 1873, the parts of the telescope arrived, and on November 12th of 1873, the first view through the telescope took place. So uh, after Newcomb had finished his work with the moons of Uranus and Neptune, he turned the telescope over to Asaph Hall, who 
uh, approximately 10 years earlier had entertained Abraham Lincoln and was now a serious observer. Uh, Hall got started using the telescope in 1876 and promptly discovered a white spot on Saturn. Uh, measuring the transit times of that white spot with a micrometer, he was able to determine the period of rotation of Saturn. Uh, this was the first really good determination of Saturn's period, uh, and it's within a, it was within about 10 minutes of the modern accepted value. But his real claim to fame is over a series of hot August nights in 1877. On those nights, uh, during the uh, between August 11th and August 17th, he very diligently observed Mars, which was at its closest opposition of the 19th century, uh, looking for moons close in to the planet. He knew that none had been uh, photographically detected more further out in the previous opposition, so he surmised that they had to be much closer to the planet. And he also read Gulliver's Travels, where Jonathan Swift actually predicted the existence of those two moons. So, uh, what you see uh, uh, on top of the two pictures on the right is the uh, photograph of the original logbook uh, from eighteen seventy, uh, from eight, August 17th, 1877, in which he discovers Phobos. He had found Deimos a couple of nights before, and he was busy making measurements of uh, the elongation of Deimos when he noticed another one uh, coming out from behind the planet. And there's a note here which says uh, both of the above objects uh, faint, but distinctly seen both by G. Anderson and myself. George Anderson was his faithful night assistant. So for 24 hours, Ace of Hall and George Anderson were the only two people on the Earth that knew of the existence of the two moons of Mars. Well, of course, we know it's not real until the boss sees it. So the next night he is out in the dome with all the top brass from the observatory and they are all making measurements. And at the bottom of the page here, you'll see the cryptic note that said Newcomb made all the measures on this page. So if Simon Newcomb saw it, it had to be real. Now, just to give you an idea of how hard it is to see these things, uh, this is a picture that I took through our 12 inch telescope several years ago. Uh, when we had a favorable opposition of Mars, there's Phobos. That's about as far as it gets from the planet. So very often it's lost in the glow around the planet. It can be a very, very difficult visual target. Uh, so this was considered one of the most important astronomical discoveries of the 19th century. Ace of Hall was given a number of awards by various foreign scientific societies. The Navy gave him a firm pat on the back and told him to keep working. Uh, and he did so for a career that spanned 30 years. One of the other things that Hall took part in were the transits of Venus of 1874 and 1882. This was a very important scientific event. Uh, and uh, the Congress of the United States appropriated about $120,000 for the Transit of Venus Commission. And American, America amounted eight expeditions in both transits in 1874. They were scattered around the Pacific Rim. Uh, in 1882, they were mostly scattered around this hemisphere. Um, but the idea was to measure uh, the timings of the entrance of Venus onto and off of uh, the sun's disk and to photograph it very, very with, with very high resolution photography to be able to measure its position with respect to the sun's disk, the center of the sun's disk. This would yield what became known as the solar parallax or the uh, which from which could be derived uh, what we today call the astronomical unit, which is the mean distance between the Earth and the Sun. So it was a very big deal. Uh, the expeditions, certainly the 1874 expeditions, some of the parties that were dispatched on that were away from the states in uh, for about a year. Uh, I really feel sorry for the folks that were dispatched to Kerguelen. 
look it up. It's in the uh, it's it's in the uh, it's in the atlas. Uh, it's about the most godforsaken place you can go, and still be on the earth. Um, but uh, that party was the first one off the boat uh, in the middle of the Indian Ocean, about twenty five hundred miles southeast of Cape Town. Uh, they were the first ones off the boat. Uh, they got off in June. The transit took place in December. And by the time they got picked up, it was June of the following year. And on the day of the transit, they were clouded out. Such was exploration in those days. Uh, anyway, uh, Professor William Harkness, who was a colleague of Simon Newcomb, uh, undertook the measurement of the plates uh, that were taken at these various sites and came up with the first really credible uh, definition of the uh, the astronomical unit uh, based on the parallax measurements uh, obtained from the transit of Venus. Well, by the late 1880s, it became clear that the Foggy Bottom site was uh, inadequate uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, at that point in time, uh, the city was beginning to surround us with other things that spewed noxious fumes. Uh, in addition to the open sewer that was basically now contained to a large area just to the uh, just to the south of the observatory, uh, to the west we had where the Kennedy Center now stands. We had the old Hyrick Brewery. I don't know if you've ever stood downwind of a brewery, but when it's cooking, it doesn't smell nice. Uh, and about a quarter mile to the north of us was the coal gas works where they burned coal to extract methane for the municipal street lighting system. So the wind could blow from any of three directions and basically stink you out. And if it blew from the east, that would not make a bad smell, but the wind would back up moisture over the Blue Ridge Mountains and you wind up with clouds. So it was really a terrible place to do astronomy from. Uh, in 1881, our uh, superintendent at that time, uh, Admiral John Rogers, uh, was able to persuade the Navy to purchase a 75-acre farm in the hills above Georgetown. Uh, unfortunately for us, uh, Admiral Rogers died as a result of malaria contracted while working at Foggy Bottom the following year, and there things languished until the latter part of the 1880s. Uh, in 1887, they finally selected an architect to design the buildings. Uh, that architect was a very famous American architect named Richard Morris Hunt. Uh, if you've spent any time in Newport and admired some of those quaint little summer cottages on the ocean walk there with names like the Breakers, well, that's Richard Morris Hunt. If you have been to Asheville and seen the Biltmore Estate, that's Richard Morris Hunt. If you have been to New York and seen the facade of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, that is Richard Morris Hunt. And if you have admired the Statue of Liberty, that the pedestal for that was designed by Richard Morris Hunt. So this is the observatory as it appeared when it was finally completed in 1893. And it's pretty much the same place that we see today. When we moved up to the observatory, in 1893, uh, we had the Great Equatorial Telescope remounted by the Warner and Swayze Company. Uh, we still use this telescope every clear night for mission-related observing. I'll talk about that in just a couple minutes. Um, and uh, it, to me, is interesting that we are still using this telescope that has the same lens that Asa Paul used to discover the moons of Mars, mounted on a state-of-the-art mounting from 1893. Uh, the 1906, in, in uh, 1893, the lenses were removed and cleaned. Uh, the, the next time they were removed and cleaned, as far as I know, was sometime in the 1960s. Um, we recently did an upgrade on the telescope and removed and cleaned the lenses again uh, about two or three years ago but those are the only times that I am aware that the lenses have actually been unmounted, uh, cleaned, and remounted. So this past year, uh, we celebrated the 150th anniversary of First Light on November 12th. And we had a number of invited dignitaries and special guests over to actually look through the telescope at Jupiter and Saturn. 
and it was a pretty remarkable sight. Unfortunately for us, the telescope is actually still used for uh, mission-related observing. Uh, today, it is used in a program to observe double stars. Uh, we use a specialized instrument called a speckle interferometer, which allows us to make very precise measurements of the separation and position angle of the stars. And it does this in a course of just a couple of minutes, as opposed to hours with the old moving wire micrometer. The telescope is also now under complete computer control, so the observers can sit in a nice climate-controlled office, point the telescope to a target, take the data, and move on to the next target. We also have a number of other instruments that were uh, introduced and mounted up at the observatory. The Warner and Swayze Transit Circle was installed in 1899. It made its last official observation on the day after the centennial of its first in 1999. It was used for a program to very precisely measure the positions of bright stars to make what we call a fundamental star catalog. Of course, precession and proper motion means that you have to completely remeasure all the stars in the catalog about once every 50 years. So the telescope was kept busy uh, for quite some time. We also built a or had a 12 inch Clark Sagmuller refractor that was built for us. Uh, that is the telescope that uh, is still operational today for the recreational use of the staff. That's the telescope that I very often get to post pictures from, uh, and it's the one that I used to photograph Mars and Phobos in that earlier slide. We also had a 15-inch Warner and Swayze astrograph. Uh, this telescope turned out to be something of a disaster. Uh, the lens was never properly uh, never properly uh, figured, uh, and ultimately it had to be stopped down to about eight inches, but it still did work measuring the positions of asteroids and other uh, transient objects. So the Washington headquarters today look pretty much the way they did in 1893. It's just the, a lot of trees have grown up around it. But we also have a Flagstaff station uh, that was established in 1955. Uh, that was done because the lights of Washington did eventually creep up to surround us. We are now located smack in the middle of the city at 34th and Massachusetts Avenue. Uh, so we had to start moving our larger telescopes out to a more remote site. Uh, and that was established as the Flagstaff Station in 1955. So the footprint of the observatory today is we have our headquarters in Washington, our Flagstaff Station. We own and operate a radio telescope in Koki Park, Hawaii. Uh, unfortunately, <coughs> that is not a station that has a permanent manning. Uh, I've been lobbying for years that they had to send the public affairs officer out there to photograph it and spend some time and understand what was going on. but couldn't quite swing that free trip to Hawaii. Uh, we also have an alternate master clock facility at Shriver Air Force Base, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So the mission of the observatory today is to determine precise time, uh, to determine a precise celestial reference frame, and to determine and disseminate Earth orientation parameters. This is all necessary today for modern means of navigation. Now, uh, back in the early part of the 20th century, uh, we kept time with mechanical clocks. Uh, these were basically pendulum clocks. The very high precision Riefler clocks were pendulum clocks that operated in a vacuum uh, so that that would eliminate air resistance and temperature changes. And they were calibrated by daily observations made with transit circles uh, that were located in transit houses on either side of the main clock house. Uh, you can see that our chronometer rating function was still going strong. Uh, we continued to rate chronometers through World War II. Uh, that eventually was tran that uh, that that operation was eventually transferred down to the Norfolk Naval Shipyard because we wound up having more uh, instrument raters than we did observatory staff, and there was no place to put them. 
We also pioneered use in uh, the use of telegraph and wireless for time dissemination. Um, this was uh, very early in the 20th century. Uh, we actually started dis uh, disseminating time nationally via the Western Union Network in the 1870s. Um, <clears throat> but as wireless technology developed, uh, we began exploiting that. And by 1912, we had a series of uh, high power transmitters at various locations around the coast of the United States that could send time signals out across the Atlantic Ocean and about halfway across the Pacific. The way we calibrated these evolved as well. Um, the transit circles were replaced with what became known as a photographic zenith tube. This is a dedicated telescope that essentially stares straight up and a small number of stars cross the meridian there. Uh, when uh, we take, we can take a photograph of when those stars cross the meridian. That photograph is triggered by a signal from a clock. And if that clock is not keeping correct time, the star image will be displaced from a central uh, gr ruled grid line on its photographic plate. We can then determine what the clock error is and make an adjustment to the clock. The short master-slave synchronome clock that's on the right uh, was developed in the 1920s and it was the most precise pendulum clock ever built. Uh, it could resolve time down to better than one one hundred thousandth of a second per day. And we were still using these pendulum clocks through World War II. But concurrent with that, they developed the first quartz crystal oscillator clocks. So on the left is a quartz crystal clock from uh, the 19, late 1930s, early 1940s. Um, you can see that it sits in a six foot rack and it weighed about half a ton. Uh, today, most of us are carrying them around on our wrists, so thank goodness for miniaturization. We installed our first atomic clock uh, in the 1960s, and today it's our atomic clock system uh, that is providing time to the world. Now, we ran into an interesting problem when atomic frequency standards were developed, because atomic frequency standards are very stable and very precise. Up until this time, the second had been defined by astronomical means. And one of the timescales that was the most precise for computing uh, ephemeris tables and almanacs was called ephemeris time. And that was measured as a function of the Earth's period of revolution around the sun. Well, we had an astronomer named William Markowitz who wanted to link the ephemeris second to a specific oscillation frequency of the cesium atom. Uh, and so he developed a system that would actually use a picture of the moon against background stars uh, to make measurements of the moon's motion and to help determine ephemeris time. Uh, so he invented what became known as uh, the dual rate moon camera uh, there were eight of these deployed around the world, and over the course of 10 years, uh, he obtained enough observations that he was able to link the ephemeris second to a specific oscillation frequency of the, uh, the cesium-133 atom. And that is what today defines the second. So we have continued to develop atomic clocks today uh, we operate six of what are known as the Navy Rubidium Fountain Clocks. These are the most precise clocks in the world today. Um, they change, if we, if we do an intercomparison with them on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, they vary from each other by no more than a femtosecond, which is 10 to the minus 15 seconds or one one thousandth of a trillionth of a second. The principle that we use behind this is laser trapping and cooling of atoms to extremely low temperatures. That won the Nobel Prize in 1997 that was awarded to this gentleman right here, Bill Phillips, who uh, was working at NIST at the time. Uh, well, we were able to hire 
uh, a number of atomic physicists to develop and build our rubidium fountain clocks. And among those was this gentleman here, Dr. Steve Peel. He is now the head of our clock development department. He was a graduate student of Bill Phillips. So if you want to know what time it is, well, you have to be a little bit more specific. Uh, there are many different systems of time, all of which are related in this graphic. I will not bother to go through all these, but it just gives you an idea of the different types of time uh, that are uh, sometimes still used for various types of computations. But for the most part, uh, we depend on what is called UTC, which is atomic time defined by atomic clocks that is offset by an integral number of seconds based on observations of the actual rotation rate of the Earth. Leap seconds are added whenever the difference between UTC uh, and UT1, which is the Earth's rotation period, uh, when they differ by more than nine-tenths of a second, uh, a leap second is inserted. Uh, leap seconds can be inserted or removed uh, depending on what the Earth does. Uh, and the Earth is really a terrible timekeeper. It does things its own way. Uh, so leap seconds are uh, not periodic. They come and go at random times. And we are actually in a situation now where it may be necessary to have a negative leap second. Uh, that will be something that will happen after I retire. It will be somebody else's problem. So as far as standard time is concerned, this year, these are the, the statutes that define time as we use it today. Uh, again, this is all legal stuff. I won't bore you with that, but just in case uh, you can look back, I'll, put a, I'll, I'll send a PDF of this to Paul in case anyone's interested. <coughs> Excuse me. So the next thing we're interested in is the celestial reference frame. Um, the two most important things that you need to know on a day-to-day -day basis is where you are in three-dimensional space and what time it is. And this is true for everything in the universe. So what we ideally want to do is observe things that are essentially fixed on the celestial sphere, uh, get very precise positions of those, and then look and see how everything else is moving against that reference frame. This was done optically for many years, but now we do very long, oh, I, I, okay, let me go back one here. Uh, I do want to point out, these are two of the workhorse telescopes at Flagstaff, our 61-inch astrometric reflector, and the 40-inch uh, Ritchie Chrétien telescope, the last telescope built by George Willis Ritchie, uh, the first telescope to be moved out to Flagstaff. One of the discoveries made with the 61-inch telescope was this bump that appeared on Pluto. You'll see it here. You don't see it here. These are very highly magnified images that were sent back to Washington for measurement by this astronomer, Jim Christie, and his boss, who was the head of the Nautical Almanac Office at the time, the late Bob Harrington. Um, they were interested in getting precise positions of Pluto to improve the Almanac's ephemeris for Pluto. And Christie noticed that there was a period, there was a periodicity between when the lump appeared here and then it appeared down here. And he realized that what he was looking at was a moon unresolved on this scale that was orbiting Pluto. Uh, and it would get to one elongation here, and then a little over three days, the next elongation would be here. Uh, so Rob, Bob Harrington computed an ephemeris for this and determined that there were going to be mutual occultation and eclipse events, and they happened right when he predicted they were going to be. So if you want to know who actually, uh, the, and this allowed us now to obtain the mass of the pluto charon system, uh, which turned out to be about one-tenth of what everybody thought it was. So if you have to blame somebody for killing Pluto, I guess it's us. We also still operate a transit instrument out there. This is used by NASA very extensively for targeting uh, occultations by uh, of by stars or occultations by asteroids of stars. 
those of you who are doing uh, any asteroid occultations through Dave Dunham and IOTA, uh, a lot of the astrometry that goes into predicting those is done with this telescope out in Arizona. But the celestial reference frame today is established uh, by very long baseline radio astronomy. It's composed of about 4,500 quasars and compact radio sources, and it's augmented by the positions of about 1 million active galactic nuclei. Quasars are so far away that they show no XY motion on the plane of the sky. Uh, so they give us a very good reference frame, and they are visible in the optical, infrared, and ultraviolet parts of the spectrum. So they are really, really good at giving us a fundamental reference frame that we can use to essentially measure the positions and motions of anything that's closer than quasars. We also uh, still do star catalogs. Well, we did do star catalogs. Uh, our most recent one was the Robotic Astrometric Telescope Catalog, or the URAT. Uh, the camera that went on the back of this dedicated telescope is this thing here. Each of these squares had one of these monstrous hybrid CCD CMOS chips in it, uh, 120 megapixels. Uh, for a while, it was the largest electronic camera that was used, uh, and it allowed us to make very precise measurements of stars uh, and proper motions with uh, very high precision uh, down to about 18th magnitude. So to give you an idea of how this evolved over the years, uh, in the year 2000, the best available catalog we had was the Tico 2 catalog that was based on the European Hipparchos satellite. Uh, we had a predecessor to the URAT that was the uh, USNO CCD astrometric catalog. It used the same telescope, but a smaller detector. Uh, and that gave us about 113 million stars down to about magnitude 15. The URAT catalog gives us uh, stars, 450 million stars down to a magnitude of 18.5. These are all plots of uh, M11 as seen with uh, these various catalogs. So you can see the density of stars increases very dramatically. Today, this has actually all been superseded by the European Gaia satellite. Uh, we have worked with the European Space Agency on the development of the detectors for that satellite. And today, that is the deepest and most precise star catalog available. So Earth orientation basically measures the small but significant changes in the orientation of the Earth's rotational pole and its instantaneous rotational velocity. Um, polar motion is basically a wobble. Uh, it's not anything, it's not like precession, it's not like nutation. Uh, it's a very small uh, circular component that has a period of about 435 days. Uh, it pro they, they produce this periodic spiral pattern, uh, and that spiral pattern covers an area that's about the size of a baseball diamond uh, over a period of years. Um, there are many different causes of this. Uh, we can, for instance, uh, see the periodic melting of snow and ice in northern spring. Most of the land mass in the northern hem or on the Earth is in the northern hemisphere. So when that snow melts, we can actually see a change in uh, the angle of the Earth's rotational pole and the velocity of the Earth's rotation. So this is a plot in the variability of the length of day. Uh, over the last um, oh, uh, 20 or 10 years or so. Um, <clears throat> and you can see there are uh, all kinds of variations that are caused by tidal interaction with the moon, uh, longer term components that are caused by tidal interaction with the sun. Uh, the bottom line is that the earth is slowing down. Uh, so uh, it's not gonna be anything that you're gonna, you're not gonna get an extra minute to sleep in in the morning. Uh, let alone an hour, uh, at least not in uh, the foreseeable lifetime of most of us. Uh, but it is nonetheless something that has to be taken into account when we are supporting things like uh, the, uh, para the, the uh, location parameters from global positioning system satellites. 
So, uh, in conclusion, uh, that gives us, uh, takes us back to kind of the beginning. This is the seal of the U.S. Naval Observatory designed by Admiral Charles Henry Davis in 1867. The Latin quote is Abe Ade Gubernandi Studium Pervenit in Astra et Pontum Sicilo Connexit. Uh, it is taken from the fourth book of the Astronomica by the Roman astronomer Menelius, and it says, Then to the pilot's care. The stars are scaled and sky with ocean joined. And with that, I will be happy to take any questions that anybody may have. That was great, Jeff. Um, let me, uh, Paul, do we have anything? I'm, I'm not seeing a whole lot. Uh, yes, Chris Keggy, do you, do you want oh, yes, to? Yes, now, I'm sorry. Yeah, hey, Jeff, wow, this was, this was, Tremendous. Um, my my wife had a career at the Department of State, and so I, you know, several times a week would pick her up and right across the street from from the observatory. And I was always curious about the history. So thank you so much. Um, this is just exciting as can be. But um, you know, I was uh, I I was surprised when you were talking about how even recently um, y'all were measuring. Uh, double stars, doing the speckle interferometry in the double stars. And I, you know, I can understand how measuring the transits, uh, you know, contribute to the, the timing or developing a sense of time and so on and so forth. What did, what did the double, measuring the double stars have to do with this, do with the mission? You said it was mission oriented. Well, there are systems that are in use uh, not only by the Department of Defense, but also uh, think of geostationary satellites that are commercial use and that sort of thing. And now you have all of these commercial uh, satellite systems that are looking down at the Earth and giving very precise geolocation. Uh, they, for the most part, use the sky as a means of determining what their reference frame is that they're looking at because the earth is kind of wobbling underneath that star reference frame uh now if all the stars in the sky were single stars they're you're looking at relatively bright stars relatively bright stars are relatively nearby uh if they were all single stars their proper motions would essentially be straight lines you could measure the proper motions for a couple of years and then project where they're going to be a hundred years out into the future relatively simple operation mm -hmm. however mother nature has uh likes to throw curveballs at us yeah she has uh, and stars. about about two-thirds of all the stars in the sky are binary or multiple star systems now you have a situation where if you want to use a particular star as a reference star and it happens to be a double star well you know uh you've got to know which component you're looking at and exactly where that component is with relation to the center of mass of the star system because the center of mass will move in a straight line but you project the orbital period and motion and inclination of the two stars uh, onto that and each component star will show a little wobble so, for instance, if you have a fine guidance sensor that is, and most of them operate in the infrared part of the spectrum, mm -hmm. and you have a double star and one's redder than the other one is, your sensor is going to lock onto the red star and not necessarily point to where the center of mass of that star is. So, we need to be able to model what that star's wobble will look like over the operational lifetime of one of these systems. And so double stars, as it turns out, is a very key component to that. Uh, and uh, that is the reason that, and, and the, thing is, the thing that I find amazing is that, um, you know, there aren't too many of these big old refractors lying around anymore, uh, let alone many of them that are actually operational uh, and that have been computerized and that have something as, uh, as th that have an, an instrument like a speckle interferometer hanging on the mm -hmm. back of them. Uh, as it turns out, from a double star perspective, refractors are ideal for this because there's no central obstruction. 
So you have a much more defined airy disk, which is almost a pinpoint. Uh, and those telescopes are ideally suited for making these kinds of measurements. So we keep that telescope going for, and we'll keep it going for as long as we have a requirement to make those measurements. Uh, and uh, we have a very capable instrument shop, so, and all the original engineering drawings from Warner and Swayze, so when something breaks, we just make a new one. We just make it out of titanium instead of brass. <laughs> Very cool. Did answer your question? Yeah, it did. So, you know, I, I'm going to take the liberty of summarizing, but you've, so in, in, in some sense, you've gone from measuring the positions of ships at sea using the stars to measuring the positions of satellites and the Earth in general in the frame of reference of the galaxy. Actually, beyond the frame of reference of the galaxy. So wow. our quasar, yeah. the quasar, oh, right? The quasars, right? Quasars are, you know, typically uh, they're they're you know eight to ten, eight to fifty, or eight to thirteen billion light years away. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the, the assumption that we have is that they ain't going to move. Right. Right. Wow. At least yeah. not at least not for the foreseeable future. <laughs> they are moving, but it they are moving, but they are moving radially away from us. Yeah. Yeah, that absolutely did answer my question. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I'm oh, going to hand yeah. off to David Worth. I saw he had yeah. a question. Yeah, I think he has a comment here. Um, old original equipment used at the U.S. and no still in existence. Uh, there, there, uh, there is some in the collection of the American History Museum. Uh, the original lens for the 9.6 inch telescope used to be on display at American History. Uh, I know the curators down there have a whole bunch of stuff. They have one of our Transit of Venus 5-inch uh, Alvin Clark refractors. Uh, they've got some of our uh, early clocks. Um, they have uh, some, uh, I think they have the uh, recording chronograph that was a, basically a, a clock that printed time. Uh, from the 1840s, from the Foggy Bottom site. Uh, I know they have them in their collection. I don't know if they have them on display. Well, like I said, Jeff, I, I, this is really great. And I, I certainly personally have learned so much from you over the years. And I certainly appreciate you taking the time to talk to these folks. I'm sorry we didn't have more people for you to listen to tonight, because we normally have more folks, as you know. And I second what David said, you're a great asset to the club. And I hope you, when you have time in your retirement that you can share more of your experiences and insights and all the many th different things that you've done in astronomy in this area. And will keep helping us uh, su succeed at, at NOVAC. And so anything we can do for you, please let us know. But it's great to have you here. And thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us tonight. All right, and I will actually uh, be seeing everybody up at Almost Heaven Star Party. Uh, I'm going to give a talk up there about 150 years uh, of the 26-inch Great Equatorial Telescope. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that. Well, if that's everything we've got tonight, I think it is. But uh, we, again, just thank you so very much, Jeff. And thanks, everyone else, for being here tonight. And um, we'll see you all out there observing. And we'll see you at the next uh, general uh, meeting in September.